I'm Mrs. Elizabeth Pruitt. I'm Policy Analyst for ACES Connection. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. It's co-hosted by ACES Connection and the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, CTIP, a national organization promoting trauma-informed public policy. We welcome you today to our webinar called Strategic Advocacy, Winning Policy Change Without Crossing the Lobbying Line. Andy Blanche, co-chair of CTIP, will be sharing the hosting fun function with me today. We will learn how to drive public policy change without violating restrictions on nonprofits or requirements by funders. There's understandable caution in the field to avoid treading into the advocacy waters and risk exceeding the legal limits on nonprofit lobbying. This reticence, however, uh, may prevent legitimate and much needed involvement in the vital public policy issues of our day. Attorney Alan Matheson, who is an expert at helping nonprofits understand where to draw the line, will walk us through the legal distinctions between lobbying and non-lobbying activities. Alan work came to our, Alan's work came to our attention when he presented at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's grantee meeting, which ACES Connection is part of. Kelly Hardy from the children, the organization Children Now, it's a California-based uh, child advocacy organization, uh, will be uh, presenting today as well. She's also a leader in an organization called 4CA, which is the California Campaign to Counter Childhood Adversity. She will add the on the ground perspective and help us apply the theory to real world situations. Kelly directs the research and health policy work of Children Now. She's also worked in Washington DC as an advocate and in state government and is an expert on health policy issues. Jeff Heald is policy director for the Redstone Global Center at the George Washington University here in Washington. And he works with local and national partners to develop and advance policy to build healthy and resilient communities. I've worked most closely with Jeff on his work with BCR, which is uh, the, or the collaborative called Building uh, Community Resilience. It's a multi-city, multi-state, uh, initiative that is working to combat adverse childhood experiences and more broadly adverse community environments, the conditions that many children are growing up in, in terms of poverty, racism, and other uh, detrimental uh, situations. Uh, he was previously the uh, chief of staff at the Administration for Children and Families and has worked in Congress for uh, some notable members uh, who are now retired, Pete Stark of California, and also Beto O'Rourke, who just today announced that he's running for president. Um, so that's uh, interesting news and timing. Jeff is an advocate on Capitol Hill and with the administration on many of the issues that we care about, and he's also working to train and motivate people in the field to become uh, effective advocates. He will moderate our Q&A session and uh, take your comments and add his uh, particular insights that he's gained over his many years in, in advocacy. Uh, there are a few housekeeping things to go over. If you have questions um, after the, the presentations by Alan and Kelly, um, Please enter your questions in the Q&A box. There's an icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, and, you know, submit them as they come to you so we can have a ch uh, an opportunity to read out duplicates and, and really focus on what the areas of most interest are. The webinar is 90 minutes long and there will be a recording of the webinar along with the slides and a list of resources, both uh, resources by ACES Connection and other um, 
organizations that will be available on the homepage and we'll also send out to those of you who registered for the, the workshop. And after a few brief introductory remarks, uh, we will also hear from Andy Blanche. Andy is an independent consultant who has worked locally and statewide to establish trauma-informed communities around the, the, the United States. She's working <clears throat> in her own city of uh, Sarasota, uh, Florida to, to get something going there. And also she's worked at the national level with SAMHSA and other, uh, or other federal agencies and is a nationally recognized expert both on trauma and mental health issues. Next slide, please. I wanted just to say a couple of words about ACES Connection. We've reached a milestone in the last couple of days uh, where we have uh, now have 30,000 uh, individuals who are members of ACES Connection and we have over 300 communities that work uh, within ACES Connection on uh, both working geographically and also on particular uh, uh, interest groups and also organizationally um, focused uh, activities. Uh, ACES Connection has a, a two communities that I wanted to mention, State ACES Action that, that compiles information on what's going on at the state level, and then Resilience USA, which focuses on the national uh, policy world. So I hope that you'll um, take advantage of that and and I would love to welcome everybody to join ACES Connection if they haven't done so already. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we'll be sending out a resource list and here are just a few things uh, that I would wanna mention. Um, I know that some of you today are uh, calling in from California. We have a very active California ACES Action community on our site. And it's so interesting and, and really uh, significant that the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, NCSL, for the last two years has been monitoring legislation that specifically mentions adverse childhood experiences. That's not the whole universe of the, the kinds of bills that we're interested in, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to, to know what's going on in addition to the reporting and uh, reconnaissance that we do at ACES Connection. Just uh, at the end of last year, 27 states considered uh, 89 bills. So uh, the numbers um, are, are really significant. They've also got a brief that I think is valuable. And I also wanted to mention that in early April, we'll be letting you know about a new resource from Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities, so the MARC initiative uh, on policy and advocacy. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide is um, uh, our contact information. I'm not sure why that's not showing up, but um, uh, it will be on the, the slide uh, deck that you will receive. Here we are. So we encourage everybody to, to be in touch, give us your feedback. <laughs> Uh, and here, here are our email addresses. Um, and I think this, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Andy Blanche, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of CTIP. As Elizabeth mentioned, we're an all-volunteer national organization that advocates for and works to promote trauma-informed policy and practice at the local state, tribal, and federal levels. Um, we take a cross-sector public health lifespan approach, uh, and we try always to look to hold up structural systemic solutions, as well as looking for where there might be gaps in services and new kinds of approaches needed. Um, in the beginning, uh, when we started a few years ago, we focused primarily on awareness building and really trying to help people understand the basic science of trauma. Um, and now we're beginning to shift our uh, focus a little bit 
it seems now that hardly a day goes by when um, a leader of Congress or a presidential candidate doesn't mention trauma in some context. Uh, so the awareness is beginning to be out there. Uh, so now we're really working hard to help people understand that how you respond to these issues is just as important as using the language and knowing that you should respond. So we're really trying to create more opportunities for practitioners in the field who have the experience uh, with what works and what doesn't work uh, to have input in, uh, into the policy uh, process. Next slide. So we try to organize our activities, and this lists basically what we do. We try to organize these activities uh, around a current policy issue or set of issues that seems to have some traction. So for example, a couple of years ago, we decided to focus on uh, the opioid epidemic. It was pretty clear that that was going to be uh, of, of great importance and attention to policymakers. So we developed a, a policy brief that, uh, that focused on uh, the role of trauma in the opioid epidemic. Uh, then uh, we organized uh, a year-long series of webinars looking at all of the issues uh, at that intersection and what was working across the country to try to stimulate a national discussion about the set of topics. And then we used our monthly CTIP CAN, that's the CTIP Community Advocacy Network calls, uh, to, to try to build um, some advocacy across the country around these issues. Uh, these calls are really our primary mechanism for supporting the education of lobby of, um, of policymakers and uh, the advocacy work in the field. They happen once a month. Um, they're 90 minute uh, calls every uh, third Wednesday of the month, I believe from two to 3.30. They're open. Uh, and what, what we try to do in these calls is uh, first, it just give people an update on what's happening on the Hill. Uh, and Jeff Hild is often a part of these calls. Um, you'll be hearing from him later. Um, Dan Press, who's our pro bono uh, lawyer and lobbyist, uh, chairs the calls. And they'll just basically let you know what's happening with specific legislation, what's coming down the pike, what are people talking about. Um, and then we use the calls to share between states. Uh, because what's happening, as Elizabeth mentioned, in the states is equally important in, in terms of uh, policy development. And uh, so we often have uh, a team from one state or another talk about a piece of legislation that they're working on, that they passed recently, or maybe that they passed a couple of years ago, and they can now report on how it's working in implementation. Uh, so basically, we do a variety of things, all uh, to try to promote um, uh, discourse and uh, public policy around uh, trauma and trauma-informed uh, issues. So next slide. Uh, another um, co-sponsor of today's webinar and a fantastic partner of CTIP is the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma, and Mental Health. Uh, they have been um, one of the leading voices nationally for at least a couple of decades on the intersection between domestic violence, trauma, and mental health. And um, they've been a fantastic partner uh, in this webinar series, in, in previous work that we've done, and really in all of uh, CTIP's activities. So along with ACES Connection, uh, just a little shout out to the National Center. And with that, I think we can uh, turn it over to our speakers. Thanks so much. Sorry, my, my uh, mute button was working there. Um, I'm Alan Madison, and uh, Kelly Hardy and Jeff Hild and I will be talking about the ways that we can do advocacy. As Elizabeth mentioned, um, people are sometimes afraid about doing advocacy from a government perch or from a nonprofit perch. And the issue often is that people just don't know what's allowed and what isn't. And in that situation, when you don't really know what the rules are 
you say, well, that smells like it might be too much or it might be too far, so I'm not gonna do it. And unfortunately, that really has a detrimental effect to our movement because there's so much that you can be doing in your role based on your passion, based on your knowledge and based on how effective your storytelling is. And so we want to make sure that we're leveraging your knowledge, your passion, and your ability to be an effective storyteller so that we can advance public policy. What we're going to talk about today is what is lobbying? You know, what's this, what's this word lobbying mean? And, and only by understanding what lobbying is can we really understand what it's not because more interesting than what's lobbying is what isn't lobbying. So how can we get our toes right up to the line by planning strategically, leveraging that definition of lobbying so that it can make our activities as effective as possible based on what we're allowed to do, whether that's in our government role, as in our volunteer role as an individual, or most importantly for this, um, for this webinar, how can we do that in our role with a nonprofit organization? And we're gonna talk about what are these rules and then we'll talk about how they apply in the real, real world. Um, as a nonprofit, nonprofits are gonna get money from basically three sources. They'll get a bunch of money from government grants, relatively plentiful, but they have a lot of restrictions on what you can do with that money. And if you're working for a government agency, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can do with your time, and we'll talk about those. Foundation grants are less plentiful than government funds, but more plentiful than trying to squeeze money out of individuals or corporations. But they come with uh, advocacy restrictions. Not as many as come with government money, but it's not like raising money from individuals and corporations. When you raise money from an individuals or corporations, there are relatively few restrictions, <coughs> but it's hard to amass a war chest there. So for nonprofits, foundation grants tend to be the sweet spot of getting relatively um, plentiful funds to fund the programs you're looking to, to, to do to serve, to serve communities and to advance public policy. And there are sort of a nice balance between the restrictive funds from government and the relatively uh, no holds barred money that's coming from individual and corporate gifts. Now, this isn't to say you should only look to government to foundation grants. You should try to get the whole panoply of funding. We should try to get as much funding from all of these buckets as possible. Um, but the foundation grants are really where we can leverage the rules to be as effective as possible. So the base, basic rule here is that a public charity, 501c3 organization, may conduct lobbying. There's a limit on how much lobbying it can conduct, but let's blast away at the misconception that C3s can't lobby. Public charity C3s, which is probably what the organizations you're affiliated with or that your government agency is working with, they're allowed to conduct some lobbying. For some of them, it's a relatively high amount. It can be up to 20%. Private foundations, which is a narrower type of C3 organization, they can't directly pay for lobbying. So private foundations are foundations that are funded from a limited number of sources, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is getting money from Bill and Melinda Gates. And believe it or not, Warren Buffett kicks in a bunch of money to the Gates Foundation too, because he knows that they'll spend it effectively, but it's a limited pool of money. <clears throat> Compare that to, and so they're a private foundation because you've got a limited family or a couple of families putting the money in, or maybe it's a corporate foundation. The other type, public charities, think of like the Red Cross or your local United Way, getting money from a whole lot of different sources. If you have that diversity of funding, you're a public charity, and you can conduct some lobbying. So let's talk about how we can conduct lobbying and how we can use the private foundation money that we're getting. Even if that private foundation money says you can't use our grant for lobbying, how do we use those restricted grants to advance our legislative goals? <clears throat> 
and just to be sure, there are a whole bunch of other lobbying rules that apply, and we're not going to get into those. But your state, for example, California, DC, everywhere in between, every state has its own lobbying rules. And those definitions don't necessarily line up with what we're going to talk about today. The IRS lobbying rules cover a certain set of activities. California's rules cover a different set of activities. Massachusetts, a, a totally different set of activities. Those rules don't prohibit you from acting. It may just require you to submit reports or register as a lobbyist. And we're not going to get into all of those because we'd be here until next Tuesday. So, as I mentioned, government employees have to comply with agency ethics restrictions that are separate from these IRS rules. And your agency's rules, if you work for a government agency, may not align at all with these IRS rules. It may be that you're not allowed to talk at all about public policy. It may be that it, you are perfectly welcome to talk about public policy as long as you get the commissioner's approval or whoever's the head of your agency. The important thing is to understand at a government agency, who would it, understand your agency's rules and know who in the agency is going to give you a fair interpretation of those rules. There are some people who are going to automatically say, you know, some agency lawyers who are going to say, oh, you know, rubber stamp rejected on any attempt to try to influence legislation or try to get involved in policy matters. And that that's not even consistent with what the agency's rules actually are. They're just afraid to stick their neck out. Other agencies have savvy folks in the ethics office who say, yeah, sure, you're allowed to do X, Y, or Z, but here's what the guidelines are. And if you're a government employee, who is restricted from engaging in some of these policy discussions, you're allowed to engage in lobbying and election activities in your free time. So the key is if you're a government employee and your agency restricts what you can do, you know, figure out what you can do on your lunch hour or on the weekends or after hours on your home computer using your home email. I mean, the way people get in trouble is if they're using government resources, like their government email account, to try to influence legislation. But in most situations, as a government employee, military officers accepted, they have their ability to influence legislation or to go and take a day off and go to Washington and lobby their legislator. And as a government employee, you have a really important understanding of the rules, understanding of how these policies impact communities. So just because you're working at a government agency doesn't mean you shouldn't get involved. And the last thing is make sure you're sharing your information and make sure you're sharing good data with folks at nonprofits who are lobbying. So that as a government employee, you're able to provide useful information and useful reports to the folks who are lobbying to carry out those activities. Okay, so the, that, that's a basic overview. There are two types of lobbying under the IRS rules that we need to talk about. The first is direct lobbying, and those are communications directly with legislators or their staff. The second one, grassroots lobbying, and those are communications that are aimed at trying to get the public to demand the passage or defeat of legislation. But let's talk about those so we know what is lobbying and then we can structure our activities to do non-lobbying activities with those foundation grants you're getting so that we can stretch those foundation grants as close to the line as possible to advance our advocacy goals. Okay, so direct lobbying has three elements. It's a communication directly with legislators or staff members about specific legislation and it reflects the organization's view on that legislation. And we're going to hand out these slides and we're going to hand out a cheat sheet with all of these definitions so you don't need to try to write it all down. But the key is you've got three elements for direct lobbying. And if you remove any one of those elements, it's just not direct lobbying. So, for example, you've got 
Direct lobbying is a communication directly with legislators or their staff members. We're talking about face-to-face -face meetings, emails, letters. I grew up in Boston. So if you're driving down the Mass Pike next to Fenway Park, there's this enormous billboard right next to Fenway Park on the pike. And if you take out, if you buy that billboard and write, Senator Warren, vote yes on S26 to help our kids, that's not direct lobbying. You know Senator Warren's gonna drive back and forth by that billboard every time she goes to the airport to fly off to a campaign event or to fly off to Washington. Or every time she's driving home, she's gonna keep seeing that billboard. But because the billboard isn't a direct communication to her, it's a public communication, that billboard isn't direct lobbying. So for direct lobbying, we're talking direct communications with legislators and their staff not, not communications that could be um, received by other people. And it also includes executive branch officials, but only to the extent that executive branch officials or staff are involved with the formulation of legislation. So if you're talking to the governor's budget director about the governor's next uh, budget request, that would fall into this category of direct lobbying. But for the most part, when you're talking to executive branch officials, that's just not lobbying under these IRS rules. And it's from every level of government, from Congress down to town meetings. But importantly for our point purposes, school boards do not count as a legislative body. So if you're talking about school to a school board about how they're addressing childhood trauma, that just isn't lobbying. And so you can use foundation grant funds, even if the foundation grant funds say no lobbying, if you're trying to ch get a school board to vote on a new policy to, ad to address uh, childhood trauma, that's not going to be lobbying. So you're allowed to use your foundation grant funds to influence that vote by the school board. Even if it's an elected school board, the rules are just written to say school boards are not a legislative body. Okay, so it's a communication to a legislator or their staff member about specific legislation. Obviously, that's bills that have been introduced. But it's also this gray area of what they call specific legislative proposals. And those are proposals that haven't been introduced yet, but where you're giving the legislator enough information that they know what to introduce. So, for example, if you... Uh, Go to a legislator and say, we need to raise the minimum wage in our state to $15 per hour and raise the tipped minimum wage to $10.50 and we should phase it in on this, <coughs> on this timeline, they would know exactly what to introduce. <clears throat> so that's a communication with the legislator about a specific legislative proposal and it would count as direct lobbying. On the other hand, if you just had a communication with a legislator that's, and you said, we need to raise the minimum wage to ensure that people are making a fair wage for their work so that they can live a life with dignity. That's not going to be a reference to specific legislative proposal because you're just saying we need to raise the minimum wage, but you're not giving them the details that they would need to know what to introduce. Okay, so specific legislation is, you know, relatively interesting, but what's more interesting is what's not specific legislation. So any executive or regulatory action is not legislative. So if you're communicating with a legislator about executive action, that's just not going to be direct lobbying. And it can be hugely influential. You know, if the State Department of Health is coming up with a new regulation to implement uh, guidelines for child care centers, you could weigh in and issue comments and try to influence that regulation, and that's a great, great idea. But it would be a lot more impactful if the chair of the Senate Health Committee weighed in with the head of the State Department of Health. So you could go to the chair of the Senate Health Committee and ask her to weigh in on this proposed regulation that they're debating over at the Department of Health. She'll talk to the health department director and she'll have a lot more influence about inf uh, she'll have a lot more influence with the health director about getting that regulation strengthened. 
great way to talk. You so all of your communications with that Senate uh, committee chair are non-lobbying, and you can pay for your staff time using restricted foundation grants because you're not discussing legislation. You're talking about executive or regulatory actions. Similarly, policy discussions with legislators are not legislation. So you can bring a legislator in to talk to uh, child care workers, bring them to a child care center to help them get to understand these policies, have them sit down with people who've confronted uh, childhood trauma and talk about the policies that they need in their lives. That's not, as long as you're talking generally about policies and not about the specific legislative solutions, that again is not lobbying. So there's a huge amount of, act, of activity that's just not lobbying that we can discuss with legislators. And it's not gonna be, you know, it's not legislation. So it's not gonna be treated as direct lobbying under the foundation grant rules. Okay, so just to review, Direct lobbying was a communication directly with legislators or their staff members about specific legislation, and it, the communication has to reflect the organization's viewpoint. So all, all the time, clients come to me and they'll say, well, <clears throat> so can I have a communication with a legislator about legislation, and I'm just not gonna talk about what my view on the legislation is. I'll be totally neutral. Is that lobbying? Yeah. No, it's not lobbying. If you just have a totally fact-based neutral communication with a legislator, but it's totally stupid, it's a waste of your time to talk to a legislator about legislation and not to advocate a viewpoint on it. Not only is it a waste of your time, but most importantly, it's a waste of their time too. Their time is valuable. If you've got a legislator's ear and you're talking about legislation, reflect a viewpoint. Just treat that communication as a lobbying communication. It's direct lobbying. And so you need to tap into unrestricted funds, like the money that you've raised from individuals or corporations. You just can't use restricted grant funds from a foundation <coughs> if that foundation says their grant cannot be used for lobbying. So you need to record your time for that meeting and make sure that you're counting that time as lobbying, as direct lobbying, and make sure you tap into some non-restricted funds, like from an individual. It's important, you know, I'm gonna talk a lot about what's not lobbying, but it's important to lobby sometimes. We want you to be doing lobbying to the fullest extent that you're allowed. Okay, so there's direct lobbying that was communications to a legislator, and there's also grassroots lobbying. And these are communications to the public. So when you think about that billboard on the Mass Pike that Elizabeth Warren is driving by every time she goes to and from the airport, that billboard falls into the category of a public communication. And a public communication is any communication that's not limited to a legislator or staff member. Everything from tweets to advertisements, speeches, you name it. So a communication to the public will be grassroots lobbying if it's a communication on specific legislation, same definitions as before, that reflects the organization's view on the legislation. And the fourth prong is it has to include a call to action. So if you have a communication to the public, like the billboard on the Mass Pike, that refers to specific legislation and reflects a view on it, but does not include a call to action, it's just not lobbying. And so that's a really specific, really powerful um, definition that we have to use as advocates. If we have public communications about legislation that do not include a call to action, they're not lobbying. And we can use our foundation grant money for those communications. So what's a call to action? So a call to action essentially is any communication that's going to nudge people to want to contact their legislator. And on the fact sheet that we send you, it gives very specific um, terms of the only things that the IRS views as being a call to action. The most obvious one is saying, call Senator Warren and tell her to vote yes on S26 to protect our kids. That's a clear call to action. 
And there's some other language that the IRS regulates as being a call to action too, because if it was just call your senator, then we could circumvent that six ways to Sunday. So a call to action is also identifying who the audience's legis legislative representative is, uh, providing contact information for that legislator. And interestingly, if you identify a legislator as being neutral or opposed to your position on the legislation, that's also a call to action. Why? Why neutral or opposed? Well, because if the billboard on the pike said, yay, Senator Warren, thanks for saying you're going to vote yes on S26, no one's going to call her because she's already doing what you say is the right thing and people are busy. People don't have time in their busy day to pick up the phone and call a legislator to say, hey, thanks for saying you're going to do the right thing. But if that billboard on the pike said, Senator Warren, get off the fence and commit to voting for S26 to protect our kids. Well, when you drive by that, you might say, hey, when I get to work, I'm going to give Senator Warren a call and tell her she's got to vote for this important bill to protect our kids. So that's why identifying a legislator as being neutral or opposed to your position counts as a call to action. Also, if you provide a vehicle for contacting the legislator, like email or a petition so that they've got, <coughs> so that you're facilitating that contact with the legislator, again, that's a call to action. But if your communication doesn't have that call to action on it, it's not lobbying. It's a really powerful tool for advocacy organizations to use and use and to tap into restricted foundation grants to try to influence the public debate about legislation. Okay, so as you are figuring out the cost of your, lobby, of your advocacy campaign, it's important to know that activities whose only purpose is to prepare for lobbying need to be paid for with lobbying dollars. So for example, if you're having a meeting and the purpose of that meeting is to set your lobbying strategy, you're talking to your coalition allies about who's going to lobby Senator Fernandez and who's going to lobby Senator Smith. The cost of that meeting counts as lobbying, as a lobbying ex expense. So I've also got here handouts that are used only for lobbying. And that's a place that some nonprofits fall into a trap and others really leverage it for important benefits. So there's this thing called the subsequent use rule. And in a nutshell, what it says is, if you create materials and use them for lobbying, the IRS says they have to be treated as a lobbying cost. Unless, unless, unless you can demonstrate that you distributed those materials broadly to the public before you use them for lobbying. So on the handout, if you write a handout and the only place you use that handout is for lobbying, then yeah, you got to cost, you got to report that handout and all the time you spent writing the handout as a lobbying expense. <clears throat> but if you distribute that handout broadly to the public before you use it for any lobbying, you don't have to charge it as a lobbying expense. So if you think through the arc of your campaign and say, hey, we know we're going to ha have a lobby day in the middle of May. Let's prepare our materials in advance. Let's prepare what handouts are we going to need on lobby day? What kind of reports are we going to need in the arc of our campaign to help convince legislators and the public that this bill is important? Let's produce them with non-lobbying dollars from our foundation grants so that they'll have an important impact on the legislative debate. So we produce that handout, that fact sheet about the bill and distribute it broadly to the public or that report that we create. We know we're going to use it at lobby day and hand it out to legislators, but before we do that, we're going to get it out broadly to the public. We're going to get it to editorial board writers. We're going to sit down with those editorial board writers and say to those editorial board writers, hey, we hope you'll write an editorial calling on the state legislature to pass you know, House Bill 15, and here's why. 
that meeting with the editorial board writer isn't lobbying because it's a communication, not with a legislator, but to the public, and there's no call to action. You're not asking them, you're not asking the editorial board writers, hey, will you call Senator Fernandez and tell them to vote yes? You're saying, hey, would you write an editorial supporting this bill? Get it to talk radio producers. They're always looking to fill airtime. And then make sure you're getting those handouts, those fact sheets broadly to all of your potential allies. Get those reports out to people in the business community and pediatricians, to PTAs, to clergy. Think about all the different places where that bill could make an impact. and Make sure you're getting the materials out to them. And that does two things, right? First, it's getting, building grassroots support for your issue. It's educating core constituencies about your issue and about your legislation. <coughs> and two, now you're building a case with the IRS to say, hey, that fact sheet about the bill that we produced, we distributed it broadly to the public and the fact sheet didn't have a call to action. The fact sheet didn't say call your legislator. It said, if you care about this issue, go to acesconnection.org and join our email list. And that's not a call to action. So this is a non-lobbying communication. And we distributed it broadly to the public. Then later on, you'll get to be able to use that fact sheet with legislators in your lobbying effort. So here's an example. In Minnesota, we had a coalition that wanted to pass a bill to promote safe streets so that kids could get to school and home from school safely. They were gonna get more funding in the state budget for sidewalks and crosswalks. They knew that this would come up in the, bill, in the budget in January. So in November, they commissioned this massive poll. It was hugely expensive, but they paid for it with non-lobbying foundation grant funds because they distributed the results of that poll broadly to the public. They got talking points out to all the coalition members. They provide everyone in the coalition with sample tweets and Facebook posts because everyone's looking for content and they released all of these tweets and Facebook posts as a drumbeat to head into the legislative session. So as you see on the slide, everyone from Mission Readiness, a veterans group, to the Heart Association, to the Sierra Club, to labor unions, they were all putting out information about how the public supports funding in the budget for sidewalks and crosswalks. They were talking about this budget issue. They were talking about the poll. They were talking about a, the budget issue, obviously, is legislation but they were talking about it to the public and there was no IRS defined call to action. It didn't say we need funding in the budget, so call your state legislator. It just said the vast majority of Minnesotans support funding for bike ped infrastructure. And then it had a link to drive people to a website that would talk about that issue and get them to sign up for their, um, for their email list. The other exception I wanna talk about for a second before we dive into some examples is testimony. And this is an uh, exception that's really valuable to all of you as experts. So if you're providing oral or written testimony to a government body, you know, a committee, a legislative committee, at their request, that's not lobbying. So because you've got important stories to tell and you have an important policy perspective and expertise to share, you can testify to these committees at their request and none of the costs count as a lobbying expense. So your staff time of traveling to Sacramento, staying overnight in a hotel, asking experts, hiring experts to help you write that testimony, all the time you spend is a non-lobbying expense that can be paid for with foundation grant funds, even if those foundation grants say no lobbying allowed. It's like a Willy Wonka golden ticket, kind of. But the issue is to get this golden ticket, the request has to be from the committee as a whole. It can't be from that crazy backbencher that you know who supports your issue. It has to be from the committee chair inviting you on behalf of the committee. So, Here's an example from Minnesota, where Rachel Callanan, who's the uh, state lobbyist there, called me up and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity to testify at the Senate Finance Committee. Can you help me get one of those golden tickets? And so 
I wrote up this letter and it a little technical, you've got to dot the right I's and cross the right T's to follow the IRS rules. But I emailed the letter to Rachel. Rachel sent it on to the chief of staff of the committee, who cut and pasted it word for word and just put it on committee letterhead and had her boss sign it <coughs> and send it back to Rachel. And so all of the time Rachel spent preparing this testimony is non-lobbying and can be paid for with a foundation grant. And it can advocate a point of view on the legislation. So if you think about it, normally, if you're testifying, it's a communication directly to legislators and their staff members about specific legislation. So normally that would be direct lobbying. But if you have one of these letters, then it's just treated as non-lobbying because the IRS wants to make sure that true experts, you know, People who are going to be getting one of these letters from a committee, they want to make sure that true experts are able to share their expertise with the government body if the government body desires that information. So it's a really useful tool that all of you as experts can use, and you just have to ask the committee chair for one of these letters. And you have to make sure the letter follows the right rules, so you may want to talk to uh, the lawyer for your organization to make sure you're complying with the rules. So do we have any, let's stop before we dive into some examples. Let me just check the chat box here to see if any have any questions or do, are there any questions that have come in, um, Jeff or Elizabeth? I don't see any questions yet. Um, so throw questions up into the chat box. It'll make it a lot more interesting. Um, and in fact, get your chat box open because I'd like to ask, you know, have people respond in the chat box to this. This is a blog post uh, that Elizabeth posted uh, earlier this month. So let's do, let's, let's hold Elizabeth's feet to the fire. She hasn't seen this yet that she didn't know that I was gonna do this. But so Elizabeth posted on the blog this post about Representative Underwood, who she brought her laser focus on toxic stress to a committee hearing. And what happened here was Homeland Security Secretary Kristen Nielsen uh, was talking about her department's treatment of, um, of it, children, children of immigrants um, and the policy of separating immigrant children from their parents. So would this blog post be lobbying and, and vote in the chat box. One, is it lobbying, yes or no? And if it's lobbying, is it direct or grassroots? And then three, why or why not? You know, what's the, what's the rationale for your answer? So we'll give just a minute to see some responses here. So is it lobbying? And if it is lobbying, is it grassroots or direct? And why or why not? Oh, and I've just been informed, tell people to use the Q&A function, not the chat function. I'm sorry about that. Use the Q&A function, not the chat function. So there's a, at the top of your screen or maybe the bottom of the screen, there's a button to hit for Q&A to respond about whether or not the so we've got one, so the question is, looking at this blog post, is this blog post lobbying or not lobbying? And if it's lobbying, is it grassroots lobbying or is it, um, is it grassroots lobbying or is it direct lobbying and why or why not? So we've got some good answers coming in, this is terrific. So I'm gonna walk through this now. So remember, we've got some responses here saying it's uh, not lobbying because there's no, it's just stating facts, there's no call to action in it. And it's a public communication. 
with no call to action. Some say it's education. Um, the issue here is though, there's no reference to legislation. So I think people, you're making it even a little bit more difficult than you need to because <clears throat> on this communication, you've got a legislator who's talking to the Homeland Security Secretary about the policy, about the regulatory policy of the executive branch agency. So this, if you think back when I talked about going to try to influence the regulations that the Department of Health is putting together and talking to the committee chair, the chair of the health committee, this is the same sort of thing as that. That right now, you've got Representative Underwood simply talking to a secretary of an agency, not about legislation. And direct lobbying or grassroots lobbying is only a communication about specific legislation. So because there's no legislation in this, it's totally non-lobbying. True, there's also no call to action in here. So even if it was talking about, even if Representative Underwood was saying that we need to pass legislation to keep families together, as long as there's no call to action, it would still be non-lobbying and ACES Connection could do that. But in this situation, it was even easier. And then I'm gonna throw it over in just a second to uh, Kelly to walk through a bunch of other um, examples. I wanna answer one question that Carolyn asked here. She said, can a C3 organize a contact system in their state about who's gonna contact legislators about specific legislative issues? And can an individual at a nonprofit directly ask legislators to support legislation as long as their, in, their expenses are not reimbursed? So, in the first question, can a C3 organize a contact system about who's going to contact legislators about specific legislative issues? Sure. If you are just setting up an issue, uh, sort of a, an email list to blast information out about legislative issues and other issues, that's not lobbying because you're just setting up your grassroots, your grassroots contact function, um, regardless of whether you're going to use that for legislation or, or other issues. If you're saying on a specific piece of legislation, okay, we know that Mary's got good contacts with Senator Frost's office, and we know that Jose has really good contacts with Senator um, Jackson's office. So we're gonna have them contact those people about this upcoming bill. In that case, if you're lobbying, if you're preparing for specific lobbying, then that would count as lobbying. But it, it depends on the situation of what you're doing with that contact in, uh, system. And then um, the second one is, if you work at a nonprofit, can you go do lobbying on, in support of legislation as long as your expenses aren't reimbursed? Well, it's not lobbying if you are not only having your expenses not reimbursed, but if you're not having your time paid for by the organization. So if you take a vacation day or you know, you're doing it on a weekend, then that wouldn't count toward the organization's lobbying limit. But if you're doing it on work time while you are being compensated by the organization for your work time, then your time counts as lobbying because the organization's paying your salary for the time that you're spending going to contact those legislators. Alan, can I chime in mostly to check my mic? It sounds like you can hear me. But also, um, on that question, does it matter that, uh, for example, this nonprofit employee, even if they take a vacation day, their health insurance, for example, is paid for um, all year? That's a good I'm, question. I'm having trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So when you take a vacation day, you know, your health insurance is still being paid for and your office rent is still being paid for. But basically, the issue on a vacation day is you're allowed to do anything you want. You know, most people go to the beach, but I have had employees who go lobby on their vacation day. Um, you know, employees at different nonprofits that I work with. And that's perfectly fine, too. You're still getting your health insurance and everything else paid for and your salary. You get, you're earning your salary on your vacation day. Part of the, part of the deal with your employer at, when you work at a nonprofit or a for-profit is that you're getting paid your salary 
even on your vacation days. And basically the employer is saying, do whatever you want on this day. And it's not attributable to, to us. The, the place where people get in trouble, the place where nonprofits get in trouble is when their employees are voluntold what to do. So they're, they say, hey, we, we need you to take a vacation day to go lobby. That's not so much of a vacation day. That's being told by your boss, hey, burn your vacation days and do your work on it. Or Saturday, uh, we're going to be doing a big lobby day and we need you to work and we're not going to pay you overtime. Um, and uh, we need you to be doing all this as part of your job. That's, that's a kind of a, that's a coercive situation where, where there's a problem. But if you're truly as an employee taking a vacation day to do whatever you want on your vacation day, yeah, then you're allowed to do lobbying, even though your health insurance keeps getting paid. Um, Great, thank and if, you. And then we had a question from Susan about, in that situation, can the employee say that this is the organization's repu um, position or only their own? And you can say that this is, if the organization truly has taken that position, yeah, go ahead and say that the organization's taken that position. But if the organization hasn't, then, you know, if the organization doesn't do any lobbying whatsoever, then the organization um, may not have taken that position. So it, it depends on the context. But yeah, if the organization has taken a position, sure, the employee can say that that organization has taken their position. But really, I mean, the basic issue here is, don't take a vacation day to lobby. Most organizations can float you lobbying expenses of a couple of days. Almost, almost every C3 has some unrestricted funding coming from individuals or other sources that will allow you to do some lobbying. So even if your time is 95% funded with foundation grants that restrict it from lobbying, you've still got 5% of your time, which is 100 hours a year that you could tap into individual funds or other funds to pay for some lobbying. So don't push the rules by trying to say, oh, we're not really lobbying or, oh, I'm gonna be on my vacation time. We want you to do some lobbying. We want you to, do, to engage in lobbying like that. So go ahead and do it. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Kelly. Uh, why don't you take over and you can go to the, the next examples. Great. And am I in charge of the slides? Alan, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you want me to forward the slides or you want to do it? Uh, that would be great if you could do it. All right, do I'll it. do it. Sure, um, sure. Okay, awesome. So I'm Kelly Hardy. I'm the Senior Managing Director of Health and Research at Children Now. We are a nonprofit. We're a research and policy and advocacy organization that lobbies um, in California, and we cover the whole state. Um, we also lead the children's movement, which is 3,000 organizations strong, trying to increase the power of kids' priorities in the capital in Sacramento. Um, so we're very much about lobbying um, the right way and about increasing power for kids. Um, and so that, I think that's an important thing to know about our organization that we're, we um, have done the, the lobbying election to make sure that we are, you know, we're, we're lawyered up. We have an in-house lawyer um, to make sure that we're doing things the right way, but we are not shy at all about lobbying and, and are often in Sacramento. Um, just a little context for those of you not in California. Um, I know that sometimes we are held up as leaders on many things, um, and we are doing some exciting things um, around childhood adversity, trauma, and resilience. Um, we still have a long way to go, of course, um, but this has been a um, years-long effort to try to increase the profile in, in state uh, policymaking um, to focus more on childhood trauma and resilience. Um, we've had lots of great uh, champions over the years, Kamala Harris in her um, previous AG job, um, 
Governor Newsom coming in has has been a champion. And of course, our um, new Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, um, is a star on the childhood adversity uh, issues. So we're very excited about the momentum. Um, we, in the governor's proposed budget in January, there was $45 million around uh, screening for trauma for children and adults. Um, so we're starting to see some concrete policy changes. I want to focus my time on giving some examples of how our 4CA coalition, the California Campaign to Counter Childhood Adversity, um, has done a policymaker education day over the past couple of years. It would, it would uh, coming up on May 1st, um, 2019 is our third year in a row of doing this policymaker education day where we bring people together. And so what you're seeing on this slide is a um, invitation to the, to the first Policymaker Education Day in 2017. Um, and it's really focused on making sure that um, people across the state know that they can come to Sacramento um, and make some noise and raise the profile of childhood adversity and resilience. Um, and come together both to, to learn more about the science of ACEs um, and about lobbying and education um, and the difference between the two and, and how we can um, raise our voices together and make a difference. So this is just the, um, the, the cute uh, save the date that we sent out. So on the next slide, you can see also um, the sample fact sheet that we put together. This is something that we gave out to all um, of the legislative offices that we visited. And we did try to visit many legislative offices. We didn't get to all of them. Um, but to leave behind with staff and policymakers, um, just about some basic facts about childhood adversity and resilience, about the science, um, and the impact on children and on adults. Um, we have found that really starting with the basic facts and with the science is critical for ensuring that um, policymakers and staff have a basic understanding to, to move from um, and that they are feeling empowered to include um, uh, trauma and resilience and ACEs in their policy making that, that that's um, once they're they're more educated about the topic we believe that then um, we have a better basis for following up and asking them oh hey but your bill on um, k-12 education doesn't have any have any reference to trauma or doesn't do anything specifically for um, children who are affected by ACEs for students affected by ACEs, can you insert that piece? Um, and so we really start with the basics um, and try to make it easy for legislators and staff who are very busy um, to, to follow. Then we follow up and on the next slide, you'll see that um, this is much more targeted um, around policy recommendations. So we, as a coalition um, with a steering committee, look through many uh, of the bills that come up um, over the year. And I think uh, so far this year, we've seen um, something like 20 bills that are really focused more on childhood trauma issues um, that we're looking at. So it's a busier year now, but um, this example shows you some of the bills that we um, were asking the legislative offices to focus on. Um, so, Alan, I don't know if you want to interject here about the lobbying versus education side of things. This is clearly saying that the 4CA coalition endorses the following bills, and this is something that we gave directly to legislative offices. Um, so, it's pretty straightforward that way. 
Yeah, I mean, this is, you guys made a tactical decision of, <clears throat> we're not going to invest a lot in this fact sheet. I mean, this was just something you created on a Word document. It wasn't expensive. It lists some of the important bills. And it says, hey, we're not going to distribute this broadly to the public. We're just going to give it to legislators. So it's a communication to legislators about specific legislation, reflecting a view on it. So you charged it off as direct lobbying. So that's just a totally smart tactical decision to make. Whereas the previous um, fact sheet was more about for a public consumption. So the first fact sheet wasn't lobbying because you distributed it broadly to the public and to legislators. Whereas you said, okay, we just got to charge this one as lobbying. So I thought that was a good duality that you did. Great. And exactly, um, you know, now I'm remembering it is a couple of years ago, but we did have uh, our major, our just folder that we um, left behind at, at legislative offices that was purely um, the non-lobbying education side of things. And then we had a separate um, piece of paper that, that had those recommendations um, that we uh, handed directly to people to try to separate things a little bit. It doesn't mean that the entire visit wouldn't be lobbying, but just to not, um, you know, Alan talked a bit about the, the, you know, all of the time that you put into creating the materials being something that's countable. And so we really tried to separate out um, that specific fact sheet uh, talking directly about the bills as being a, um, a separate activity. Moving along, we also included in our packet um, community stories. So again, this is uh, basic education really to try to get legislators more connected to the issue. Um, and uh, this is, a, to make these readable, I, I really did just pieces of the fact sheet and you'll see later on in the presentation, I give the link to um, the 4CAKids.org website that where you can download these materials and, and um, you, you know, uh, use them yourself or uh, uh, edit them. But um, for an ACES connection was really instrumental in making sure that we had stories in legislative districts that were important um, that we could say, here's what's happening in your community, in your district um, on these issues and why it's so important. Um, we invited legislators and staff to do follow-up visits to, to talk with people in district um, around what's happening. Um, for example, with Resilient Berkeley. Um, all right, and then we, again, on the next page, you'll see the community data sheet. This is, again, providing information, right? So um, you may not know, but in your district, uh, 10% of children are living in deep poverty, for example. Um, trying to give, give legislators and staff some of the facts that they would need to um, prioritize childhood trauma and resilience as an issue and to understand the, the impact that it's having in their own district. So just raising the profile again, and this is not lobbying here is, is um, even though it's tied directly to that district, um, it's really about providing information. And Alan, I don't know if you want to chime in uh, on this one. It doesn't reference any legislation. So it helps to give people, it helps to give legislators a clear understanding, but this falls into that category of being a policy discussion about your district. And, and it can help to get them to the place where they recognize the need for legislation. So it certainly is a helpful part of that overall arc of a policy campaign, especially the way that they've compared each district to the statewide average. Thanks. And so that, um, you know, what, what we found um, in bringing so many diverse people together for the Policymaker Education Day, is that a lot of folks are really scared of crossing this lobbying line. Um, and even if you mention, um, that this is connected to your district, um, that people were afraid that that was lobbying. Um, I know that after hearing Alan, you all know that that is not, but um, uh, people are afraid um, often about even 
mentioning that something's happening in a legislator's district or saying, you know, assembly district one, which is obviously connected to legislator X, um, that pointing that out specifically could be lobbying, which is obviously not true. And I just wanna encourage us all to be braver because our, our kids need us. Um, we then went on uh, to have directly visits with lawmakers and often with staff. Um, you all probably know this, but um, staff can be even more important than the legislators that they represent. Um, especially with term limits in California, um, which has changed a little bit over time, but staff can be around much longer. They're unelected uh, uh, rulers in, in many small systems where they develop a lot of policy expertise and the legislators come and go. Um, so it's critical not to dismiss um, staff, even if they look like they've just graduated from high school. Um, they, they, uh, are, are really critically important um, and can quickly rise up the ranks and develop a lot of expertise. Um, uh, even I think in a state as big as California, you would think that we would be a little more sophisticated, but Sacramento is a very, uh, it's a small, small world. Um, and so it, it feels like, you know, you see this, I've been at Children Now for um, 13 years and you see the same staff over and over um, and uh, you know people I worked with when I was in DC are still in those same jobs so um, just make sure that you pay lots of attention to staff because they are really critically important and, and can often deliver your message in a way that perhaps their boss can hear um, if you're not if you're not yet um, really close close with that lawmaker um, so the dashing man in the middle and in, in the chapeau, in the hat is, um, is uh, uh, the legislator in this case. And you can see that as we went through the Capitol, everyone's wearing their badge. We had special bags that, um, you know, all looked the same and said 4CA on them to really raise the profile and make people ask, oh, what's 4CA? What's that about? Um, again, it's a small world and you need people to see um, and talk about your issue. Great, I'll, I'll also just mention that on social media, this is another way that's not um, expensive uh, to get the word out. And we had our um, hashtag, which we update each year for CA Kids with the Year. Um, where we try to live tweet and say, you know, I'm going to see so-and-so um, in the legislature about this issue. Um, and here's just an example of some of the tweets. Uh, we also do a, a recap of all the tweets with that hashtag. I think it's called Astorify. I'm not totally sure. But um, we then uh, keep those. Um, so that we can later look at them and um, uh, show funders and others, um, uh, let people in the legislature that it's, you know, we got this much, this many eyeballs looking at, at the issue. Great. So I think um, that's it for the, the 4CA uh, work, but um, you know, as I said, we're having another Policymaker Education Day this year and are very excited to continue the momentum and keep um, pushing forward for kids, both in the education side and lobbying. Thanks, Kelly. There was a question here that I think you'd be well equipped to answer. How do you protect the organization? <coughs> Let's say you endorse some legislation and then in the legislative process, the bill evolves and you've got some amendments that, me, that basically gut the bill. How do you protect your organization from that? That's a great question. So it's um, a lot of time. Uh, you, I'm not sure how this works in every state, but in California, you sign up for, um, you can sign up for, to be notified by email every time a bill gets changed. Um, this is if you're not already intimately, if you're, 
sponsoring or co-sponsoring a bill, you would be intimately involved in the discussions about when a bill gets changed, right? But um, say you're just supporting a bill, but you're not super in the loop um, with the organizations or the, the legislative office that's, that's leading on that bill. Um, I get an email every time a bill gets updated um, and I look closely at the language or, or someone I work with looks closely at the language. Um, and you can also see it's, they're amended in a strikeout fashion. So you can see what was changed in that bill. Um, and then for each hearing, um, you, it's new this year in California where uh, your support letter, letter will carry on to the next hearing unless you pull it proactively. So that's a change. But previously and probably in many states, for each hearing, you would have to submit a new letter saying you still support the bill, amended version 314 2019. Um, and so that's the way, you know, it's a lot of staff time to make sure that you're up to date on the bill, but um, there is technology and, and other ways to, to really stay up to date. And have you ever been in a situation where your organization supported a bill and then, or maybe you opposed it and then the bill changed and your organization had to take a new position? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's, it's not super common, um, but it does happen, especially I think at times a bill is entirely gutted and amended. So um, it used to be something about childhood trauma and resilience, and now it's about, um, you know, tractors. Uh, and we, children now doesn't necessarily want to take a position on a bill about tractors. So um, uh, that does happen, and um, generally, if it's something that dramatic, the staff who's analyzing the bill, you know, wouldn't carry over a, a support letter from a previous group. But um, we have before had to uh, change our position on the bill, go from support to support if amended, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I've had a, that's a really good example there. I mean, I had a client who, what they do before every bill is they say, here's what our policy bottom line is. And we've got this specific bottom line. And if this bill changes so that it falls below that bottom line, we're yanking our support. And they're not gonna tell the legislators exactly what their bottom line is because they're trying to get way above the bottom line. But they know internally, hey, if this bill we're going to lose some things and there are going to be compromises. And if the bill falls below that line, we're yanking our support and they'll go ahead and have to and do that. And that's just part of the lobbying. That's part of lobbying is you got to recognize the bill doesn't measure up. We're going to pull our support and you may ruffle some feathers, but over the long term, legislators are going to respect you and re respect. Oh, they're going to pull their support if I weaken this bill. So I better not weaken the bill too much. Um, we had a second question from Gail. Uh, Gail asks, on this policy recommendations fact sheet, for example, if you share the recommendations beforehand with the general public, like sharing it through ACES Connection, would it be non-lobbying? And really what that question gets to is, how broad does, pu does broad <coughs> public dissemination have to be? And I get that question a lot from groups. They say, hey, yeah, so we're going to create a fact sheet. Is it enough if we post it on our website? Does that count as broad public dissemination before we use it on lobby day? Or what if we tweet it out and post it on our website? What, you know, what's enough? And the answer is, you're going to need to sit across the table from an IRS agent if you're ever audited and try to say with a straight face to the IRS agent, yeah, we distributed it broadly to the public by doing X, Y, and Z. And the question is, are the, ans are the examples that you're giving enough to satisfy that legislator? So if you're just putting it up on your website or only sharing it with an email list of people who support you, that's not going to seem like very substantive public education. If you're able to say, you know, in the example that I provided earlier, we got it out and we had a total of 
uh, six, 60,000 different impressions on Facebook because we shared it with these different organizations and they all retweeted it to their followers and they're, they've got a total of 60,000 followers. Or we did a 15 minute segment interview on drive time radio on WTOP. And at that drive time, they had 600,000 listeners. So we got out to 600,000 listeners. Those things will be a lot more credible to the IRS agent than saying we posted it on our website. So, and of course, by getting it out to the public broadly, you're doing more grassroots lob um, grassroots education and building the public support. So it has a dual benefit to it there. One thing I wanted to mention, given where we are and given that there's an election that's gonna be heating up, it's already heating up at the presidential level and later on this year, Senate races and congressional races will heat up. As 501c3 organizations, you can't support or oppose candidates. And that's a really important <coughs> prohibition where you have to stay on the safe side. This isn't one to try to push the line or try to push the envelope. That doesn't mean that as a C3 though, that you have to be silent in an election. It's important, you've got an important perspective to share and you can do a lot of important public education and candidate education about ACEs about childhood trauma. And so here's a good example that Voices for Virginia's Children did in the 2017 election. And keep in mind, Virginia is on an odd year election cycle. So this is a report, a lengthy report that they produced that talked about all of the issues related to economic security for children. It had what Kelly had referenced. It had a lot of breakdowns by district by district so that different candidates and different legislators could see how their district fares. It talked about outcomes. It talked about all sorts of economic measures that are relevant to children's, to children's health and to children's success. And the key here is <clears throat> you need to, as a C3, provide it to all of the candidates. It's not the kind of thing where you can give these materials just to the candidates that you like. Because as a C3 organization, you don't like or support one candidate over, over the other. But as a C3, you can educate all of the candidates by providing educational materials about your issues to all of the candidates for a given office. And you can say to those candidates, we're experts. We'd love to come in and sit down and give you a briefing on these issues. And then as long as you're you know, making that offer available to every candidate for a given office, you know, if some candidates don't take you up on it, that's their loss and you can go in and give a briefing to the ones who do. But the key is, and what becomes difficult is, if you're successful, some of those candidates will be like, hey, this is fantastic, I love this information. Can you write me a speech or can you write me talking points? And as a C3, no, you can't do that. You need to end um, with the information you're sharing for everybody. You can't become their speechwriter. Um, so let's, I've got one question here and then uh, Jeff, do you want to jump in with, a, uh, with the perspective, perspective you want to add? All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep, um, yep. Th thanks Alan and Kelly, that was uh, uh, incredibly um, helpful um, for me and I think the bottom line as I, as I reflect on what you all said is uh, one, we can't be scared, and also we've got no excuse. Um, and you know, there's plenty of rules to keep kind of us uh, lawyers uh, busy um, and with clients, um, but there's almost always a way for us to um, legally and effectively um, advocate. And I would just bring in my perspective as a as a staffer um, for a long time that. Um, the importance of the voice that um, your organizations um, have um, really can't be uh, overstated. I think Kelly raised up some, some great examples, um, but in every office um, I've ever worked in, we didn't do anything unless we heard from uh, basically a, um, a robust enough number of folks on the ground. Um, and my boss would always ask me whenever there was a tough vote, 
you know, who have you heard from? Um, and so I really can't underscore how important it is that we as advocates are um, active and strategic um, in, this, in this realm. Um, and one of the other things that, that Kelly raised that I really wanted to lift up was the importance of staff relationships. Um, in the context of term limits, absolutely. But just in general, um, having worked for elected officials, um, they're running around uh, from meeting to meeting, they're worried about raising money, um, have a million and one things going on. And it's really the staff that have uh, the wherewithal and the responsibility really to dive into deeply into some of these um, issues in any way that's, that's meaningful. And the, the currency or the relationship you build with staff um, is really the currency that, that uh, can, can really guide and um, support your, your work. Um, and the, the other thing I'd add um, to what Kelly said that I think is so important as one of our mantras here um, is that uh, don't use data without stories and don't use stories without data. Um, and having um, that combination is a really, um, is a really powerful um, tool. Um, so I think uh, we've got, uh, I've got a couple questions I'd like to get to, and I think we've got um, one uh, queued up here. Um, so this question, uh, and I think Alan or Kelly, or we can all kind of tag team this one, uh, says, I understand we can become uh, their speechwriter. We can't become their speechwriter, but can we respond to specific questions, provide data, reports, et cetera, just to that legislator? And I'm, I'm thinking of just a concrete example that I would always have on the Hill, which is... I think Leslie's question is specifically about candidates, right, Leslie? Yeah. I think in I, her question, she wrote that as we were talking about candidates. Um, and let's, so for candidates, no, you can't become, you can't provide special information to candidates, but if you've prepared reports or data and that candidate comes to you asking for it, yeah, C3 can get some say, oh yeah, we wrote a report on that, here you go. And that's why Voices for Virginia's Children um, had, this, had this report and created it. But it really actually, Jeff, that's a great issue. Talk about it from the official office perspective of a legislator. Right, so, um, you know, one, one question I would often get from, from my bosses are, hey, go find out what X organization thinks about this, right? And so um, I'm in the position of calling, you know, Voices for Virginia's Children and saying, hey, uh, we've got this bill, what do you all think about it? Or, hey, my boss wants to do something around trauma, what should we do? <laughs> and then, so from the organizational perspective, you know, what, where's the line um, for them, I think is, is, is probably the, the question. Yeah, and that's a really good issue. That it's a glad you raised that. That comes up a lot, where that's a communication with the legislator or legislative staffer about specific legislation, and you're reflecting a view on it. So it's direct lobbying. When even when the legislative staffer calls you at an organization, it's still direct lobbying, even though you're not reaching out to that staffer. But it's hugely powerful, as you say, Jeff. I mean, the legislator specifically wants to know what your organization thinks. So just charge it as direct lobbying time. Yeah. Um, so Alan, I wanted to get to one other question here, um, which is from someone who uh, their organization basically puts a blanket prohibition um, on lobbying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they ask, is there any way to get around this? And then as you're answering that, I thought maybe you could touch on the role of board members of organizations. Sure. Um, and if there are effective way to utilize our board members as we often recruit them because of their political connections, right? Sure, they're, well, as an, as an employee, um, you can, in your free time, you know, when you're not being paid either as a vacation day or after hours, you can lobby as much as you want as long as you're not being paid by the organization. Um, so you can, uh, in this situation, they're talking about a coalition. If the coalition doesn't allow any lobbying, then you could say, this is what I do, this is my professional background, and this is why I have expertise in this issue. Speaking for myself, here's what we th I think 
this bill needs, or here's why this bill would be important. Uh, if the organization or the coalition itself doesn't take a position on legislation, you can't do that. But as you say, a really important tool that we have are our board members and they've been recruited. Well, they've been recruited for a number of reasons. One of which is they have money Two of which second, which is they have connections. And, you know, even the, those who an important question to ask the board members is what legislators do you know? A lot of them are the top donors to the representatives or the senators from their district or from their state. So they're donating to your organization. They're also donating to candidates. And so they have an entree to those candidates in many cases, um, or they have prominence in the community, or they have expertise in the issue. And all of those are valuable. And so, yeah, definitely tap into your board members and have them contact legislators about this legislation. And they can, A, you're not spending money from the organization when the board members, the board members are volunteers. So you can tap into them and there's no expenditure by the organization. So there's no reportable lobbying activity. Great. So I think we're um, at time here. So Andy or Elizabeth, are we um, kicking it back to you for some final thoughts? There, there we go. Um, this was terrific. Um, there was so much more than I even anticipated we would cover. I'm very excited about doing more and not not being worried about it myself. And I think uh, I'd like to echo Kelly's charge to us, which was to be brave because uh, so much really rests on our involvement and our effective involvement. Um, so I really want to just uh, thank uh, everyone for participating, both the people watching and the great questions and to Alan and Kelly and, and Jeff and to Morgan who works with ACES Connection who does such a great job in making the technical part work along with many other things. And everybody that registered for the webinar will get the slides uh, and Alan, I look forward to the fact sheet that you mentioned, we'll include that in the resources. And uh, for the participants, um, you know, please send things that you think are valuable. We, we, we can't get enough information about what's going on in the field. And we've also done two other webinars. They're archived on ACES Connection. One is about Alaska bill that passed and how they got through, how they got that through the legislature. It's a wonderful story uh, to promote brain science uh, in state policy. Um, and we also heard from Laura Porter about the self-healing communities model. So, um, and also before I forget, I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards, I don't want to forget uh, to thank Andy Blanche and uh, uh, CTIP, which is a terrific organization trying to make a difference at the national level. So thanks to everybody. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. and thanks to everyone who thank helped organize that.